And this is the 25th year uh, of the Leadership Park City program and of sponsoring this community lecture once a year. And tonight we're really fortunate, and I think you all realize that, um, a number of months ago, I invited Rob Katz to speak. He is the uh, chairman and CEO of Vail Resorts, which is not only an integral part of our community, but um, one of the real movers and shakers in the resort industry worldwide now. So, uh, and it, he's got a, a fondness for this place, and he's uh, spoken to some of our leadership groups before, and we're really proud to have him here. Let me just explain how we're going to do the evening. I'm going to introduce Rob just in a few moments, and he'll speak uh, for as long as he likes, actually, but probably around 30 minutes. Uh, that'll be followed by um, me um, asking him questions, although if I don't have more lights in this, I'll never see the questions I want to ask him. But those, uh, those questions will all deal with, with um, uh, leadership issues. And so I'll probably do that for um, 20 to 30 minutes. Uh, there's a hard stop tonight at 8.45 because he has to catch a plane back. So I will stop it at 8.45 so that he could leave. But probably we'll have at least 45 minutes from questions from the audience. And of course, one of the things that are hallmarks of Park City and since we are in the hospitality business, is to be hospitable <laughs> and to be uh, considerate <laughs> and to be gentle. Uh, I think we can all do that. Uh, when we ask questions, um, I'm not looking for speeches from any of you. We don't need any diatribes. We don't need any big preambles. If you have a question to ask, it should be succinct and to the point and something that he can answer. And I'll ask Rob in the same vein to answer it succinctly so that we get as many questions from you as time permits. We'll have uh, uh, microphones that go around the, uh, into the audience, two microphones, so we'll only ask you to speak into the microphone because we are recording this. Uh, we have several FBI agents in the back that are taking names. And we do have, <laughs> we do have our, uh, our Park City's finest here tonight to assure that we're all civil. Uh, saying all that, again, it's a great pleasure of uh, the Leadership Park City program and Park City to welcome Mr. Rob Katz. Rob, uh, do you want to come out? <laughs> I just want to start off by, uh, by really saying thank you. Um, it's a real honor, uh, Miles, to, uh, to have you invite me to come. Uh, and to be here on the 25th anniversary, and I got a chance to spend some time with the uh, uh, class earlier today, and I think it, it just speaks volumes uh, that this community puts uh, this kind of emphasis into leadership. Um, I, I shared with the class earlier today that um, I think the ski resort industry and mountain resort communities have a lot of threats and a lot of challenges that we're gonna be having to face in the future, and we're gonna need leaders. Um, and so I think it is incredibly wise um, that this community puts this kind of attention to it. Uh, and I'm thrilled to be here because leadership is something that uh, I've been super passionate about and we'll spend a little time tonight talking about that. So let's see if we can get this to work. This is not the first time that I've been on a big stage in front of a big crowd here in Park City. Five years ago, I was on a stage um, <laughs> in a play called The Epic Follies. <laughs> and unfortunately, my good friend there, Chris Sanchez, right, has, I think he's moved, but um, yeah, but it's kind of unbelievable, actually, to think about here I am up on this stage talking about leadership, um, given where all this started. And how many of you remember The Epic Follies? <laughs> Woo! So it was... <laughs> It was a, uh, I came, obviously I, I, I had a sense that I might have a small part in the play. Um, the key though was it was funny. Um, and I felt like if, yeah, if people are gonna make fun of me or our company, it at least has to be funny. And it was. Um, but I thought one thing that was kind of interesting was, um, how many of you remember how the play ended? So the play ended, uh, as I recall, um, with the Valians and the folks from Powder Corp killing each other, lying on the stage all over the place, and then somebody came out to essentially with a big broom to clean up the mess, and that was Bob Wheaton. 
But, but now I'm, I'm still on the stage. <laughs> But I do think it highlights, right, something that I'm going to talk about in tonight's talk, which is change. And it's one of the biggest and most important things about leadership in, for me, which is as a leader, you need to be able to deal with change. And I think certainly, as everyone here in this community can attest to, there's been plenty of change. If I want to be clear on the kind of leadership that I want to talk about, so there's analytic leadership, there's even business leadership, there is... Um, uh, strategic leadership, uh, there's political leadership. I really want to talk about uh, personal leadership, right? The, the kind of leadership that's about people. Um, and to me, you know, that's been so core to everything that we've done at Vail Resorts and so important, especially given the size that we are and all the growth that we've had, is how do we deal with uh, the people um, who work at our company? So I'll start with uh, what I think leadership is. And to me, leadership is a relationship. Um, it's a relationship between people. Uh, and I think this is often very overlooked when people talk about leadership. It's so easy to get caught up in, the, in, in all the fanfare about it that sometimes people forget that actually leadership at its core is really about a leader and a follower. By the way, that leader doesn't necessarily have to be somebody with a title or a role. A leader could be uh, a first-year lift operator at our resort who's leading by example to the rest of their team or to his supervisor. Uh, and at our company, we have this uh, phrase that we talk about a lot, which is that we expect everyone at Vail Resorts to be a leader, no matter what your title is. Why? Because everybody can be a leader. Why? Because leadership is nothing more than a relationship, and it is how you impact uh, those around you. Leadership is not a broadcast. Um, and obviously, since I'm standing on this stage, I hear that this is you know, being carried live by the park record, and so it's going out to, I'm sure, five billion people. Uh, maybe that sounds odd, because obviously I am currently in broadcast mode right now. But I, I, don't, I think this is the kind of leadership, standing on this kind of stage, that everybody sees and thinks about. But it's not really what leadership's about. Sending out an email to thousands of people, sending out a press release, making grand speeches, I think is only right, one small part of leadership. And honestly, if that's the only part of leadership that you take on and engage in, uh, I think you're missing the core of it and are likely to be the kind of leader that falls into uh, some very uh, typical traps of leadership. So if leadership is not a broadcast, I don't know if you can read that, but it says good leadership starts one to one. So in our company, we really prioritize this concept that if you want to be a leader, show that you can lead the person next to you. Don't spend a bunch of time talking about how you're going to lead a whole resort or you're going to lead a whole department or a whole restaurant or a whole uh, ski patrol unit. Talk about how you can lead the person next to you um, because it's within that relationship that I think um, that's uh, where leadership really begins. Um, that's where when you can show that you can have an impact right, on somebody else. And in the end, leadership is, right, what does it mean? It means the kind of impact that you can have on other people. Uh, and to me, I always look, uh, when, when we're looking at leaders across our company, I always look at who's making that impact on those closest to them. Not who's you know, the biggest joker in the room making everybody laugh, but nobody really has that relationship. This is, in my opinion, really at the core. And once you can show that you can, hey, I can, you know, I can show that I can have impact on a co one colleague of mine, hey, maybe I can have impact on five people. Maybe then you start to build and try to broaden your leadership role uh, within our company or with anything. I think this is, right, key fundamentals. Um, and to me, if you wanted to know the kind of leader I am, the most important people to talk to are the people who work for me, right? You know, Bill Rock. Pat Campbell, Chris Jarnot, right, my entire executive team who literally spends right, a ton of time with me in meetings and offsites, communicating with me. Yeah, how they feel about me, how they connect with me is the most important thing. Now, that doesn't mean that I don't have to realize that I have a huge impact on so many other people, and I have to be constantly cognizant of that, but if I don't get that leadership relationship right with a Bill Rock, 
yeah, uh, there's no way I'm going to get it right for all of Park City. Why leadership? Why do I, started by saying I'm super proud and enthusiastic to be here to talk about leadership. Why is it that I care about leadership? Um, it's actually the reason why I joined Vail Resorts. Um, and probably, again, for a lot of people who, who have seen me, read about me, engage with me, you probably figure, yeah, this was all about business and driving this huge, successful enterprise. But the truth is, that was not actually why I took the job as CEO. I took the job because I saw an opportunity to do something kind of unique on the leadership front. How did I get to this stage? Um, so I got to this stage, and how I got interested in leadership was a little bit of a roundabout way. So uh, I started my career on Wall Street. Um, I graduated from college, went to New York City, and started working in the, um, in, in the finance industry. Um, and I actually had loved it, was passionate about it. I loved the analytical part of it. I loved the problem solving. Uh, I loved the risk taking. Uh, and the opportunity to try things, and some of them worked and some of them didn't. But as the years went on, I was working in New York, I got married, uh, I wound up having two kids, uh, and my wife and I started to feel like as much as we enjoyed that life, it was not really the life that we wanted for ourselves or for our family. And we started talking about how we wanted to make a change at some point. Uh, and we kept talking about it, as a lot of people do, as I'm sure many of you have done in this room, uh, and you hear about folks in the big cities, you know, talking about eventually wanting to make that move. But it wasn't until 9-11 that we really got the gumption and the kind of impetus to leave. 9-11 happened, impacted us uh, quite a bit, and we felt like if we were ever looking for a sign that it was time to do something different, that was it. And so we literally picked up in the beginning of 2002. Um, and said we were going to move our family and was not really about where we were going to work. I was fortunate that um, I'd started with this finance company in New York pretty early and had some success, so I wanted to choose a place that really spoke to us uh, on a deeper level. Um, and so we started a search actually around the country in terms of where we wanted to raise our family, uh, and we ultimately chose Boulder, Colorado, uh, which is where we live. Um, and I got to Boulder, and I was doing a little bit of consulting, uh, but really, um, you know, that was probably occupying maybe 10 or 20% of my time. And when I got there, I really decided that I wanted to pursue something where uh, personal relationships was uh, a higher priority. On Wall Street, there's an old saying, I'm sure many of you know it, if you want a friend, buy a dog. Uh, and that, you know, more true than not, unfortunately. And I felt like that was not all that fulfilling. And so when I got to Boulder, first I said, okay, time to start being a real husband, a real dad. Um, uh, so focus on those relationships uh, closest to me. But then I started picking up yoga, meditation. I started going to leadership classes. I started to do all kinds of group leadership work. Um, I started to do group therapy. I started to do meditation retreats. Um, all the while, I was cycling and mountain biking and skiing and doing all the things that, uh, you know, everybody loves about living in one of those towns. Never shaved, wore cargo shorts every single day. Uh, people in Boulder absolutely were convinced that I was a bum. Uh, a little surprised when I ultimately took this job, but, you know, like, how could that possibly be? Um, but no, that was really what I was heading towards. Um, and. Here is a little known fact uh, I have never actually said publicly before, but before I took this job at Vail, which I took in uh, uh, February of 2006, uh, I was heading in a different direction. So I had applied uh, and been accepted uh, to the contemplative uh, uh, psychology program at Naropa University and had basically uh, was heading to be a therapist. And I decided that my uh, that was my calling, that I did not want to be involved with business at all, that I actually wanted to be um, a therapist and do that work, lead groups, and I had some ideas as to how I could do it maybe differently than, than people necessarily were doing it. And Boulder, like, you can, you can do anything, and everything is out there, so I felt like it was this perfect opportunity for me. Uh, so I was literally from, I don't know, December of 2005, uh, taking the prerequisite courses that I'd never taken in college, um, to actually get into the program, and off I went. And then along came Vail Resorts. So actually, my contact with Vail Resorts started back in 1991. So I've been around the company now for close to 28 years. 
And it started when my uh, investment firm in New York uh, made an investment in what was then called Vail Associates. And when Vail Associates, then called Vail Resorts, went public in uh, 1997, I went on the board, and so I've been on the board of Vail Resorts now since that time. That investment firm in New York sold the investment in Vail um, around the time that I actually moved out to Boulder. So I, I did not move to Boulder um, because of Vail. I mean, I, I, in a way I did because I love skiing and I love the mountains, but, uh, but it wasn't really about Vail. Um, and one day, uh, and I stayed on the board after uh, my investment firm Apollo sold out. And one day, I got a call uh, from a couple of the directors. We, the, my predecessor, Adam Aaron, had left, and now we had started a search uh, for his replacement. Um, this is a true story, too. I was appointed to lead the search effort for uh, Adam Aaron's replacement, um, and in Dick Cheney style, picked myself. <laughs> No, <laughs> that's not totally true. Um, the truth is I got a call from a couple of directors and they said, hey, you know, you've been so involved with the company, you're so passionate about it, um, maybe you should consider uh, taking this role. And, and when I heard it, I was like, well, okay, that, that sounds interesting and I am kind of interested in the company and I've known the company now a long time, but being a public company CEO and being a public figure didn't seem to be what I wanted, and I seemed to be heading in a very different direction, um, and <laughs> becoming a public company CEO seemed like a big U-turn from being a psychotherapist in that moment. <laughs> um, turned out, actually, they were closer than you might think. <laughs> so why? So then, I obviously, of course, made the decision to take this role, and first and foremost, it started with thinking about the ski industry um, and what I enjoyed about the ski industry. So obviously, I, you know, like everybody, I loved uh, being outdoors, being up on the hill, um, and I've loved the sport. I, I started skiing, yes, in jeans, uh, at Hunter Mountain uh, when I was about 11 years old. Uh, I never came out to Vail in uh, 1991 for the first time, and of course, I've never skied back east again. Um, but, but, but from a business, that was, you know, like I didn't need free skiing, so if I was gonna take this job, I needed it to be about more than that. And what I felt like was that I looked at the company, and I had obviously seen it up close for a while, passion. All right. What I loved about the ski industry as a business was passion. People were so filled with emotion. Um, they had so much love for the sport, for the resorts. They had so much love for their job. Um, and that seemed to me to be you know, a huge and amazing opportunity. Uh, because I'd seen so many different companies from my time on Wall Street, uh, that actually trying to create passion is really challenging. I mean, if you have a company where people are not passionate, you, you could spend a lifetime trying to instill passion and you may not ever get it. And here was a company where everyone came to work with a ton of passion. Now, a lot of that passion, um, I, I quickly realized, was not necessarily for Vail Resorts. Um, so the love that all of these people had uh, was really much more for the people. So what I realized was that you know, anyone I talked to within the company, uh, what you heard was, yeah, I love my job, uh, I love this resort, and I hate Vail Resorts. Uh, and so that, that didn't seem that welcoming or inviting. But everyone also said, and it was so amazing, I hear this even today through all the new resorts that we've acquired, that people love the people. That literally, they, they love the people they work with, they're super, you know, um, uh, close with them, they, they, they really would do anything to support them, uh, and that to me felt like, okay, right, here's a company with a ton of passion where people care about other people. This is maybe a place where some of the stuff I was doing in Boulder and working on, hey, maybe that could, could make sense and be successful. And I felt like from this perch as CEO, it was just a unique opportunity, and so that's why I took it. What I started to see, though, was that although everyone in the company liked, loved their colleagues, they weren't necessarily leading right, their colleagues. The one thing that I saw that was missing within the industry um, was, was the people leadership. Um, you know, there was so much passion and so much engagement that everyone kind of relied on that. But I didn't see a lot of effort being made to how you develop people in their careers. Right? How do you coach them? How do you mentor them? How do you unlock their potential? Um, and what I thought was, was that, and, and by the way, liking and leading are really different. So, you know, if liking somebody 
yeah, is, is when you're friends with somebody. Leading somebody, yeah, more like an athletic coach. Right? A, a great athletic coach is not necessarily always going to be liked by the athlete, um, but, but their job is to get the most out of that person and help them succeed. And I kind of felt like maybe my opportunity with this company was to come in and try and pivot some of the passion and emotion that everybody feels, uh, not towards me and not towards Vail Resorts, right, the public company, but towards their fellow employees to lead them, to really help them and support them through their career so that they could be successful. So the goal I had when I joined was, hey, here are all these people who are so positive and passionate. What if at Vail Resort, every single person was a great boss? What if every single person was a great coach or mentor? Um, right? On the one hand, that seems like a crazy, uh, over-the-top ideal that like, you could never achieve. But on the other hand, I kind of felt like, well, if we're not trying to achieve that, like, what does that say about our company? Right? Shouldn't our company be the kind of company, shouldn't within the ski industry where there's all this positive uh, energy, shouldn't that be about being great leaders, great bosses, that we're all here to help other people within the, um, you know, re really explore all of their potential and all of their possibility. And that shifted to this focus on careers. Um, and right now, uh, you know, well, when I came, what I saw was, was that there were these amazing people who were at the top of these mountain resorts, but for the most part, these were people who had the grit and determination to just, you know, climb their way to the top uh, and, and make it on their own. Most ski resorts were not providing any pathway for people, like pulling them through the process so that if you came in, uh, as a lift instructor, as a ski instructor, or a lift operator, or a ski patrol, that there was somebody really helping you and pulling you through to actually get you to the top of the industry. And one of the things I think that I saw you know, coming, and I, I'm sure all of you have seen this too, is there was gonna be a generational change happening at the top of the ski resort industry, where so many people had been in their roles for so long that there was not necessarily a pipeline of people coming behind those folks. And so I had the sense that maybe our company could be an instigator for that, mostly by example, showing that we could create an environment within the ski industry that was more similar to other best-in-class companies in other parts of uh, travel or other parts of corporate America. We could create a leadership pipeline. And the thing that I am most proud of today uh, about our company and about what we've done is that as we sit, sit here today, we have uh, uh, 18 mountain resorts. Um, the COO or GM, general manager, of each one of those resorts um, has been promoted from within our company. Um, and uh, almost every single one of them has spent extensive time within our leadership programs um, and has really benefited from that. And now they have taken on these new roles. If you go through the senior leadership teams at almost every one of our resorts, all of these people came from within Vail Resorts. Um, and that, to me, that's the thing that I look back on uh, with a ton of pride. We have, uh, you know, three women who are running mountain resorts. We have two women running mountain operations at resorts. We have a woman who's the president of our entire mountain resort division. Uh, these were all folks, you know, in a, in a, in a male-dominated industry, these were all folks who benefited from this effort we've made to try and create this leadership pipeline. Um, that's the good news. The bad news, uh, or still where there's opportunity, is that we've done good work uh, through kind of the manager level uh, at our company, but have not yet reached all the way down truly to that seasonal population and really showing people how we can bring them forward. Uh, but that is absolutely our number one priority as we think about the next three to five years for Vail Resorts. So I thought I'd also talk about maybe a couple of the four or five leadership lessons. So I've been in this role now 13 years, uh, and uh, along the way I've, I've had plenty of ups and downs, things that have gone well, things that haven't gone well, and I've taken away a couple of points. So I thought if today's <laughs> topic is leadership and we've got our leadership class here, I would share these for what they're worth. Self-awareness. Somebody actually asked me just earlier today, I had a meeting with a group of our employees at Park City, and somebody said, if there was only one thing that you, that a leader could focus on, what would you tell them to focus on? And I said, self-awareness. 
Why? Well, because the people who follow you, the people on your team, they're going to see through you in five minutes. And so you better know what they're going to see when they start looking at you. And I, I too often see leaders who act as if they don't realize everybody's watching what they do, and they're seeing all of their challenges, they're seeing all of their flaws, and yet the leader themselves don't see it. Um, so to me, right, a leader has to spend the time to actually get uh, uh, under, an understanding of who they are. And one of the things that I learned along the way was um, if you have a challenge, something that you do that, that can negatively impact those around you, um, obviously the goal is to try and change that about yourself. But it's not so easy to change habits. Um, and so for me, one of the habits that I had when I first joined and still do today is I'm very passionate, uh, I have strong views, and especially when I get really energetic, I can talk right over people. So I can be in a conversation with a lot of people, and instead of listening, uh, I can you know, trample people. Because I, it not, I'm not trying to do it to hurt them, but I just do it because I'm enthusiastic. But one of the things I tried early on was I would share with people, hey, listen, I'm really charged about this topic, so I may you know, talk really fast or talk over you, and I just want you to know that before we start. And what I found was, was that you know, everybody was like, oh, OK. <laughs> and everybody kind of relaxes. Now, that doesn't mean I should be doing it. And of course, we, we, none of us, all of us want to show up in our best possible way. But once you put out there some of the things that you struggle with, you'll see everyone around you, instead of hating you for those things, they're going to feel closer to you. Candor. So obviously, the only way for somebody to get self-aware, typically, is to have someone else provide them candid feedback. Uh, and this, uh, this is a struggle, I would say, especially in a company like ours, where everyone really has such affection for each other. Um, you know, I, again, there are a lot of other companies out there, certainly back when I was on Wall Street, where nobody had any problem uh, giving people candid feedback. But here, right, it's like, well, wait, I don't want to hurt the person next to me, so I don't know that I want to be so candid. The challenge, though, and I, I share this with, with folks, is it's a little like you were walking around the office all day with mustard on your face. So the question is, and here you see somebody been walking around the office all day with mustard on their face. Do you tell them that they have mustard on their face? Now, you know when they tell them they have mustard on their face, they're going to feel embarrassed. They're going to realize, oh my god, I've had mustard on my face all day long. So it's not going to be fun to tell them that. But of course, if you don't tell them, well, you're not really being the friend. And I think what we've tried to do at our company is say, hey, I get that everybody is friends and everybody has this close relationship, but giving people candid feedback about how they could do better is critical. Another point, candid feedback doesn't mean just criticism. Candid feedback means celebrating as well. Candid, good and the bad. Everybody's like, oh my god, you know, what's, please don't. But it's like, no, people have to realize that feedback can absolutely be a positive. This is a, one of my issues as well. So I tend, when I want to be candid, always have tended to default to the critique. Why? Because I don't tend to celebrate my own successes right enough. And so I always tell leaders, like, make sure when you've done something well, celebrate it. Be candid with yourself about what you've accomplished. Now, sure, I don't want somebody who's boastful. But so many of our leaders don't take credit for what they've actually delivered, and then that usually rubs off because they don't give credit to other people. So a couple other lessons. One, it's not about you. So when I started at Vail Resorts, um, I had this new position. I'd never been in a public role before. Uh, and I assumed that it was my job to do everything. Right, that anything that was happening in this company was my responsibility, uh, and yeah, that I had to show people that I belonged in this role. And so what you wind up doing, and what I did, was you come up with these ideas and you start trying to push them through. And you don't actually look to gain support or look to gain buy-in from a lot of other people. And I feel, when I look back on my 13 years, I feel like the first two or three years, boy, you know, I, I was pushing way too hard internally, externally, and not realizing that you have to build alignment over time. That actually it is not about you, right? As a leader, it's about getting other people to buy into your vision that you don't have to be the only one delivering. Um, and this was a really 
tough, hard lesson uh, for me when I started and one that I, you know, I continue to work on. As a leader, not totally about you. Next, it's all about you. <laughs> so this is the other trick. <laughs> so what do I mean by that? What I mean is then, then you move into this mode. So I started to build alignment and get people and realized that it was going to take time and I had a lot of amazing leaders that joined our company who really gave me such sage advice um, uh, to help point the company in the right direction. Then I kind of felt like, okay, this is good, this is working, I'm going to step back. I actually am an introvert, so I actually don't, you know, I, I, I would rather be home watching billions uh, <laughs> than here talking in front of all of you. Um, I would rather be watching a Netflix series. Uh, I'm not a big, you know, party goer. So to me, I kind of felt like, great, leadership's not about me, I gotta, I'm going to recede into the background. What I learned, though, is that as a leader, you are a public figure, and people are looking to you to lead, and you can't escape that responsibility. And I, I hated people who I thought were into being a public figure, and so I didn't really want to go around our company being a public figure, because that felt like, well, the real leadership is making the, the good decisions. But I quickly found out that, no, like, if you're stepping into one of these roles, you need to put yourself forward. People want to know who you are. They want to connect with you. They want to talk to you. And so today, um, I now travel the company, uh, all of our resorts, multiple times a year, multiple meetings, probably 60-plus different employee meetings, community meetings, other things, right, to really try and create this connection uh, that's not, you know, necessarily in my nature, but I know is critical to being part of a leader. So if you're a leader, act the part. It's all about them. So what does this mean? What this means, in my, for me at least, has been that actually leadership is all about the people you're leading. And a great leader um, realizes that they need to support. Everything that they do needs to be about the people around them, uh, the people that are on their team. Um, and when I first I kind of heard this, and there's a concept out there called servant leadership, which many of people, many people might have heard of. Um, I had the sense that if you were making it about other people, that meant you were a very altruistic, charitable, you know, always thinking of others type of person. And when I took the role, I, I, I mean, I, I felt that a little, but I didn't feel that a ton. Uh, and I kept thinking about this servant leadership, like I was going to be a servant, and I, I never could really kind of lock into it. But I learned something along the way which is actually that as a leader, you are showing up for the people around you not because you're doing it as, a, as an act of charity, but because that's how you will get the best results for yourself. That as a leader, your best opportunity to drive impact is by empowering, supporting, and engaging um, with everyone around you. And that was something that was, right, this, it's, it becomes like this great cycle that actually I can be here for everybody else, and then they actually deliver all the results. Also, I felt, I realized that I had to be there in different ways for every single person on my team. So when I'm with Bill Rock, I've got to show up differently than when I'm with Kirsten Lynch, our CMO. And initially, I started to feel like, that doesn't feel very authentic. I'm, I'm changing my style, and, and our industry, and the, you know, ski resorts in general, I think the over, you know, overlay defining feature is that we are authentic. And so this concept of actually trying to be there for each person on my team, showing up in a different way, over time I learned, no, that's not me being a chameleon. That's not me being phony. That's me truly putting them first and, and being willing to do what I need to do just like an athletic coach to make sure that Bill is doing the absolute best job he can do, and that might be me showing up in one way and making sure that a Pat Campbell shows up in a different way. And that's actually part of leadership, and that's authentic to the goal of unlocking their potential. Finally, it's all about us. So this, to me, was around how uh, the company needed to be one team. Uh, and I think one of the things, every, if, you, if I said to, in this room, who here is a good team player? Hopefully everybody would raise their hand or would want to be a good team player. But what does it mean to be a good team player? What it means is, is that you're going to put the goals of the team in front of your own goals. 
Now, you can still be an amazing team player without giving up your identity, without giving up what makes you unique and special. And for our company, we needed to embrace this philosophy because we've got all these resorts, and they're totally unique. Park City is not like Kirkwood, and Heavenly is not like Vail, and Whistler Blackcomb is not like Mount Brighton, right? But for our company to be successful, they all needed to be willing to be part of one team, and we needed a culture where within each of those resorts, they were not sacrificing their unique identity just because they were part of Vail Resorts. And this has you know, captured a lot of chatter out there about the homogenization of resorts. And to me, I, I, you know, there's no doubt that our company has to be on the lookout for any kind of homogenization because each, the reason why we're successful is because all of our resorts are different. So we can't make them the same. But I'm always on the lookout for people who are worried about homogenization but really don't want to be that team player. Really think that if I'm a good team player, I'm losing my uniqueness. This is something that's been critical for us as we've looked to the future. It's all about change. So I started with that in terms of what's happened in Park City and all the different things that have gone on. Um, and I think, I, you know, I'll say it again, I think as a leader, everything around you is always going to be changing. The only question is, is whether you are changing with that maybe faster than that, but certainly not slower than that, and certainly not standing still. And this is obviously true for our company. Um, and, and this is one of the things, it's the good news, bad news about Vail Resorts. The good news is we are always willing to change. Um, so that means that, yeah, we are out there willing to look for new improvements, willing to look for new ideas. The bad news is that people are always dealing with change when they're uh, around or a part of our company. But then the good news is, when we do things that are a mistake or wrong, we're willing to change from that too. And we're willing to improve and take feedback and keep moving. And this, in my opinion, is something that the whole ski industry needs to more deeply embrace. And I'm gonna use a couple of examples. The snowboard. So the snowboard was created, invented, right, by um, Jake and Donna Burton back in the 80s. And the good news was, was that when the snowboard was invented, the entire ski industry embraced it wholeheartedly and just loved the snowboard and said this was the greatest thing that had ever happened. No, oh, that didn't happen, actually. This was vilified, right? The snowboard was going to be the end of skiing as we know it. It was ruining everything that was great about the sport. It was banned by tons of resorts, maybe still a few resorts, I, I hear, <laughs> still ban snowboards. Right, because, and I still get letters from people saying, I wish you would ban the snowboard. Um, I got hit with somebody, they were on a snowboard. I hate snowboarders, they need to be, you know, all of this. But what actually happened with the snowboard? So the snowboard, rather than killing the industry, saved the industry. Because the skiing and riding, right, had creative free expression. And so the fact that resorts were ultimately willing to embrace the snowboard, and freestyle skis, and then by the way, of course, shape skis came out of this, which was a huge additional boon to the sport, made us different than golf and tennis, which have been struggling for years. Action sports, which is the fastest part of the, you know, fastest growing part of the overall recreation industry, happens on ski resorts in the winter, all because of this terrifying <laughs> innovation back in the 80s. So again, a good reminder, right? Another evil invention, the season pass. So when we introduced the Epic Pass in 2008, taking the price of a season pass from $1,800 to $600, people thought we had, this was gonna be the end of skiing, that we had ruined the sport, that you know, the riffraff were now gonna be showing up at Vail because we had made the you know, pass so inexpensive. Crowding, I mean literally the end of the sport. Which is interesting to me because all we did was make it cheaper. The product was already there. It wasn't like we, I mean, this wasn't like the snowboard. All we did was provide people a discount. But what's amazing to me is, right, it did reflect change, and by the way, even today, even after this product and the approach to it has been copied in the US and all around the world, there's still chatter about how the season pass and these mega passes are somehow gonna ruin the sport. 
And to me, right, that, that this is the same thing again. Because the pass is saving the sport. Because yes, it's true that this winter has been an amazing winter. Um, and, uh, and, but this is not what we can rely on, right? The sport needed to push people's purchase decisions to before the season. And it was absolutely worth giving people a big discount to do that. And yes, there are, and you know, I'll talk a little bit about some of those in a, in a slide or two, but yeah, there are other questions and issues with big ski companies and the impact that they're having, but it isn't and shouldn't be about getting people to buy their skiing before the season. We just announced Epic for Everyone. Epic for Everyone basically was um, an extension of our season pass so that now people could buy a season pass from one day to truly every day in the season. If you buy the product now, you could ski next year, spring break, at Park City for $106. One day, all right? That's not a bad thing. And I think, you know, for us and certainly for the rest of the industry, I want to, this is one of the things I think we do have to embrace um, if we want to see our industry survive well into the future. Here's something, though, that we are woefully behind on. So if one of the challenges, everyone talks about how the ski industry has not grown in the last decade. Well, one of the reasons why we haven't grown is that we have no engagement with the fastest growing parts of our population, minority groups, people of color. This is something that, yeah, I, I, I wish I could stand up here and say that here are the 10 things our company has done. I'm not sure we've done anywhere near enough on this. But our whole sport has to embrace this. We have to show leadership on this if we expect to be a relevant and thriving part of the outdoor um, industry 5, 10, 15, 20 years from now. And one of the things that has to go with this is change. Right? We need to realize that our industry, uh, we as a company, need to uh, embrace hiring people of color, make it a priority. So when people of color come to our communities, they look around and they don't feel like they don't see anybody like them, which today, unfortunately, and I can't see the whole room, but I think it's probably the case. And that's not healthy and not right, and I don't think it's something that anyone in our industry really wants to be our legacy, that we are a sport only for white people. Can't be that way. But one of the things that has to go away if we want to really address this, and it'll sound funny, but it's true, is the Jerry of the day. So for those people who don't know what Jerry of the day is, it is a video that goes around social media mocking tourists or beginner skiers, right, who look funny or act funny or do funny things. One of the things that our sport has to realize is that we cannot be just for the expert skier. If we want to welcome new people into our sport, we need to embrace the fact that beginners and tourists and locals and people who don't ski like us or look like us are welcome and embraced. And I hope if I'm standing, if I get invited back in five years, I hope that I can you know, be on this stage talking about things that we and the rest of the industry have done to help address this. The community. All of you. Um, I, you know, I said when I first came to the community back in, you know, over five years ago, uh, is that the community is a critical part, right, of the ski resort. And that our, we have a huge responsibility to be investing in supporting and doing the right thing for the community. Yes, it's the right thing to do. It's our civic responsibility. But it's our business responsibility as well. Because the community is one of the key things that people experience when they go on vacation. And the people who come to Park City are not just coming for the skiing. They're coming for what goes on in the town. And in fact, the reason why Park City is crowded and why there are people who are dying to come here and we see growth all the time is not really because of the mountain. That's only a small part. It's because people can have a comprehensive, incredible vacation here. It's because of all of you. And so when you look at our ski resorts, the ski resorts that do the most visits, right, are not about the ski resorts that have the most terrain or, or the best and most extreme skiing. It's about the resorts that have the most vibrant towns. And so one of the things that I'm super proud of as a company is our support of the communities and the 12 million a year um, that our company gives out to charity across you know, hundreds, literally hundreds of nonprofits. That's why my wife and I have made such a priority out of giving back to these communities because it's like our responsibility and smart. 
um, for us to be doing that. But there also are things where I think we've fallen behind on the community side, and you know, th these won't be any surprise to you. Uh, one is affordable housing. Um, all of our communities are struggling with affordable housing. Why? Well, because we came out of the recession, like the communities did, and said, whoa, we got all this employee housing and no one was in them. They, we had huge vacancy for years coming out of the recession. So what happened? We didn't invest in affordable housing. Most of our communities didn't invest in affordable housing and we went on and on and on and then all of a sudden, Airbnb came, came, you know, came onto the scene, scooped up a lot of affordable housing beds, the business kept growing and then everyone started looking around saying, we have no housing. And now we're playing catch up and as much, and, and I wish that we could snap our fingers and spend money to bring on housing, but it takes a long time. This was a mistake, and I think it was a mistake by us, and it was a, a mistake by our community partners too. And I hope we're going, you know, we're going to go through another recession at some point, and I hope that we collectively keep investing in housing through that recession so when we come out the other side, we don't find ourselves in the same spot. The other one is wages. And I think, you know, a little bit different, but, but similar in that, especially entry level wages in our, in our, for a lot of our frontline jobs, um, you know, coming out of the recession, everyone was so focused on just trying to survive that we didn't move those wages for a number of years. And then all of a sudden, right, we started to move them and then the entire market moved and the cost of living went way up. And now we have made big investments in wages, but absolutely still have room where we have to improve and to keep investing, and much like housing, an area that we have to stay way out in front of um, so we don't fall behind because we have a commitment, our company does, and I think our communities do, uh, to have a sustainable environment for people to live. That's the only way we can be a long-term successful company. The last thing I'll share is just um, it's leadership is a journey. If you're out there trying to lead, I feel like this all the time, you're gonna do some great things and some things that, that don't go so well. You're gonna have good days and bad days, um, and leadership can be a bit of a grind. Uh, and I always kind of you know, explain it like you are, when I started road cycling when I got to Boulder, and I started going up the canyons that come out of Boulder, which is some pretty incredible you know, uh, uh, cycling opportunities. And I would always be on the climb, paddling away, and just be thinking to myself, I can't wait till I get to the top, I can't wait till I get to the top, I can't wait. And finally, like after about six months of this, I was like, why am I saying that? Like, stop climbing. Like, if you don't, if all you're doing is saying, I want to get to the top, then, yeah, then you're doing the wrong thing. And so I started to feel like, no, you've got to enjoy the journey. Enjoy the path. Um, and have fun. And the truth is, you know, through all of this, um, it's critical to enjoy and be, you know, we're here in a passionate, have fun industry. Um, we're all here largely because we have chosen to be part of these incredible little special places, we need to have fun while we're doing it. It doesn't mean that there's not a ton of things that are wrong, a ton of things that need to be fixed, but yeah, let's remember why we came here. And this picture is a picture of my uh, executive team last June on the top of Mount Mansfield um, uh, in, uh, in Stowe, um, and it was one of our offsites. And what I'd say is, yeah, I, I could not be more thrilled, one, to be part of this industry, that I get to, you know, I love what I do, I love the sport that I'm in. Um, you know, it doesn't mean I'm, I'm thrilled every day, because uh, there are ups and downs, but the fact that I get to work with these people, um, yeah, folks like Bill, every single moment, that's what gets me up. And that's what makes me uh, get out of bed every day, and that's what makes me, yeah, totally passionate and energized um, about trying to make this entire industry and all our communities um, better, sustainable, um, and a place that, yeah, we'd all want to be long into the future. Thanks. Most people would say that the, really the job of the leader is to tell the story. And I think you totally demonstrated that tonight and how important that is for you, whoever the leader is, to stand out and be in control of the story, not to embellish it, not to lie about it, but to be honest about it, like you said, to be authentic about it. And I think that came across. And is that something you had to learn or did, over time, or did that sort of just develop? Um, I think a part of it, uh, I, I, when I was in the uh, finance field, 
one of the things we had to do was identify investment opportunities and then present on them right. to a bunch of people who had a very short attention span. Uh, and uh, yeah, and if you know, they were gonna dismiss you quickly if you didn't make your point. And so I think I, uh, this ability to try and distill down what the story was, I think, came from that. The public speaking part um, and being able to tell it in front of a room of people, I, I was not very good at when I started. And I do tell people, people come up to me sometimes and I say, well, you're so good at it. And I'm like, no, I've just practiced it. Practice. So I do think practice, you know, just get out there, even though you're not gonna be great when you first start, get out there, tell it over and over again. Right. And if you don't do it well, get some feedback and then keep shifting and changing. Right. You also talked about change. And um, I think you mentioned that most people don't like change. Um, so how do you lead people through a process they don't really like? <laughs> I don't know. I think I'm still learning how to do that well. Um, I think it, in part, is a, is a couple things. One is tell people why. Make sure that if people are going through change, they understand the why of that change. And then make sure you're clear about what you're going to do during the change. And then that actually happens. Um, and so I have found, and, and I think this has been true with a lot of our communities, that uh, our communities, for instance, that go through change, they don't, uh, they don't agree with everything that we do. But they do come to appreciate that when we say yes, we say yes, and actually we will follow through, and everything that we say we're gonna do, we will do. If we say no, they may not like it, they know that that stands too. And over time, that actually, as long as we're more consistent, I think people become more willing, I think, to go through change. Now that said, it's always hard. You know, and, and, and I, 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 we talk in our company, when we acquire a new resort, uh, we go through an integration of that resort into our company. And um, we talk about the valley of despair. <laughs> because in every change, right, there's a moment where everyone's just furious and pissed off. And we try and tell people, not everybody's going to love you, but people will understand and see that if, if you're walking the talk. So if you, as you have helped to build a corporate culture, uh, do you find that then people are drawn to your company who want to participate in that kind of experiment? <laughs> um, I, think, I think people are drawn to it. I do tell people, I was just interviewing somebody um, the other day, and I do share that a couple things about our company. One, um, nothing stays the same. <laughs> so if you come to the company, you need to be ready for that. I also tell people, this is the kind of company that really believes that people are, are, are super important. Um, but it also means that we're going to focus on people and try and help them through their leadership path. Uh, some people like that. Some people think they like that, but don't really. They like to hide in the corner. And we really try to share with people that we don't have a company where you can go hide in the corner. Um, if that's what you want to do, then there are probably better places to so go. So do you ever have that conversation with people? I, someone once referred to it to me as the northbound train. <laughs> so you say, you know, you have some people in there, and you can see that they're not quite fitting in. You say, um, this train's heading north. Maybe you should look at the ticket and see if you have a southbound <laughs> ticket. Do so you ever we, have that conversation? We, we have. Our, okay. our phrase is, you need to be on the bus, right? Okay. The bus is moving, and you need to be on the bus. And we do spend time saying, hey, listen, we want to provide all the support, all the tools, everything we can to get you on the bus. But at some point, you have to make a decision about whether you're on the bus or not. Okay. And over the, just the last few years, obviously, uh, Vail um, Resorts has been in a total acquisition phase. How do, how do you digest all the new acquisitions and inculcate the culture that you've so carefully cultivated uh, without losing it, because you, you said it's one-on-one, -on -one, and yet you're, you're bringing in a lot of people with different ideas, different viewpoints, have done things differently. How hard is that to integrate people into the corporate culture? It, it's hard, and, and I think it's, it starts, though, with having a, a culture that's aligned to begin with. And I remember, actually, one of the things when we were going, again, five years ago in Park City, we were going through all those challenges, and there was a lot of, uh, yeah, I mean, a, a lot of questioning about us and how we were showing up. But I also remember hearing that uh, no matter who from Vail Resorts came to engage with people, people felt like they were all on the same page, right? That they were, we were not, we didn't have talking points that everybody was speaking with, but we all were coming from the same vantage point. And every time we do an acquisition, what I hear from the acquired resort is that they're going through challenge, but they always say, you know what, everyone who came out here from the corporate office or from another resort, you know, wow, they, they actually were, one, 
like me, they're passionate about the ski industry. Two, yeah, no one was backstabbing. No one was talking behind other people's back. There were no politics behind the scenes. It was like people were showing up. It was tough work. It was hard, but they were, they were together. That's critical. Two is giving people time. Uh, you know, not when we acquire resorts that we just acquired, you know, Stevens Pass. Well, there's no way for us to, we're not going to go out to Stevens Pass and say, hey, we need you to be completely on the Vail Resorts culture day one. But we want to see motion towards that. We want to see movement. Um, and that people are not, to your point, like somebody who raises their hand and says, you know, well, I don't believe in any of this and I don't want to do any of this and I'm, I'm on the southbound train. It's like, okay, well, the train is going the other direction. Right. Um, so you need to be pretty clear about you that. You do, and, and you need to be, I think, clear about what people can't be doing, but give people time, right, to buy into the, you know, the overall effort. And you talked about um, some of the challenges facing the industry. Uh, I always call it reality therapy, that, uh, <laughs> because I, I've always contended um, that very few people move to a place like Park City to deal with reality. Um, we're all here to escape it. <laughs> and, uh, I know, you I know, know, you said you want to be a psychotherapist. Well, here's sort of a large outpatient <laughs> example right here. You're just looking at the, I could do so, well here in Park City. You could do well, <laughs> and you are doing well. How, how do you deal with criticism? There's a fair amount of criticism <laughs> that anyone who's successful um, is subject to. Some of it valid, a lot of it not valid. No, I think um, we do, we get a lot of feedback, um, and I get a lot of feedback from every single angle, uh, from our employees, from our communities, from guests, from uh, governments in all different levels. Uh, and, and, I, and by the way, every time I go out to one of those 60 meetings across all of our resorts, I'm getting tons of feedback then. Uh, my approach to it is two things which are hard to do at the same time, but I think critical. One is, um, make sure to not dismiss any feedback. So sometimes when you're getting a lot of feedback, it can be really easy to just tune it all out and kind of, kind of go into a bunker mode. And you can't do that. On the other hand, don't take any of the feedback too deeply. Um, and you need to, for me at least, I found that you, you find this spot where, you, and you realize that when people are giving you feedback, uh, 99, unless it's my wife, <laughs> right, it's not personal. <laughs> and, you know, in the end of the day, like, like people, you know, in, in Park City, uh, when I was here, like, they don't know me personally. They, they, they are upset about what the company's doing. And, of course, I had a part in that. But I realized that, that yeah, I, 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 that allows me to stay present, I think, with the feedback and say, okay, I'm hearing what they're saying. I may agree with it. I may not. But there's probably a kernel of truth. There's, in almost every feed, piece of feedback, there's some kernel of truth. And actually, I always tell people, like, the more feedback bothers you, the more true it probably is. Do you think you recognize a mistake the fourth and fifth time you make it now? Um, I, I hope so. And, and that's where that team, no, that's the <laughs> that team, right, I rely on that team to mm -hmm. tell me, hey, Rob, that's not, you're not doing the right thing. And, and this is not going in the right direction. Um, and I, I rely on all, of, and on all of these employees. I, I almost feel like, you're, sometimes it, a lot of the decisions that a lot of people would think, oh, well, Rob Katz is making every one of those decisions, it's, 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 that's like a myth. Mm -hmm. Decisions are actually more crowdsourced than you might imagine. And I think that's where you get to better decisions is when, <clears throat> hey, you're taking in feedback all over the place. You, you still may disappoint people, but yeah, but you're not making the decision alone. Okay, and because of the time, I'll just ask one more question, then we'll open it up okay. to the audience. But um, you included, and you make a big deal out of it, but of the moral dimensions of your leadership and the moral dimensions of your community and the moral compass that you have. And one way you do that is you think it's very important to give back, mm -hmm. both personally and corporate-wise. I mean, why is that so important? Not every corporation does that. Um, I, I think it's part of the, our ethos. Um, uh, as a company, I think we feel, um, yeah, like it's something that all of us are passionate about on a personal level. But, but it, it's it's just good business. And I, I, you know, I got this question earlier today about how do I talk. We had our investor conference actually here in Park City just last week, and um, somebody asked me, well, how do you talk to your investors about your commitment to zero and your environmental program, and why do they go along with it? And I, I share that we go to great lengths to showcase how these things that we're doing for the community, doing for the environment, doing for our employees, well, they're smart. They're not just the good thing to do, they're smart. Mm -hmm. um, on a personal level, you know, I, um, 
as maybe comes across a little bit better, like when I, when I took this role, like I did not expect um, the kind of success that we've had at all. And obviously was heading in a completely different, I was on the southbound train <laughs> and didn't even realize there was a northbound train. Uh, and yeah, I think my wife and I feel like uh, we've been super fortunate to be able to participate in this. And therefore, yeah, as every time we, you know, we've, we've sold any stock, it's you know, to be put back somehow into some kind of charitable effort. And we felt like the mountain resort communities were um, you know, something that, that's so important to us and something that has obviously been, we've benefited from. And so yeah, it seems only right that that's where we should be, you know, be giving back. Well, thank you. Love who you're with, <laughs> yes, love exactly. who you work with, love what you do. I want to thank, of course, all of you for coming out tonight. I think it's been a very worthwhile night. I want to thank the people who helped us put it together, Minda and Emma and, and Linda. I want to thank the uh, city and county councils. And the city has, uh, I was going to lift this thing, weighs a ton, but. <laughs> We want you to put this on your desk, Rob. Uh, it is Park City, and hopefully you'll never forget us, and you're always welcome back here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you so much. <laughs>